I'm Molly Bloom, and it's a huge honor to be here speaking to you, all 3,000 of you. <laughs> um, but you might be wondering why I am speaking to you. After all, I'm a convicted felon, so what do I know about business or intelligent growth? And my mom always tells me to look for the similarities instead of the differences, and I try to listen to her these days. So number one, we're all here because we care about success. And this is a story about a 23-year-old kid that built an elite international multi-million dollar brand with no sales force, no CRM software, no marketing, and no experience. Number two, this is a story about failure. And everyone in their life fails. We all fall down. And how do we get back up? How do we refuse to stay down? And if neither of those things resonate with you, well, it's an entertaining story. So I grew up, I was born ahead of the game. I was born to two parents who cared deeply about raising successful and ambitious children and kind. And it was all going perfectly. I was an only child until my brothers were born. And they ruined everything. And one of them's in the audience right now, actually. And it wasn't just that they were born. These were tiny, evil, superhuman prodigies. They, you know, Jordan came out of the womb, like basically playing chess and doing advanced calculus. He went on to be a Harvard-educated cardiothoracic surgeon. And Jeremy came out of the womb, basically a, an athlete prodigy. I mean, this kid was, a, is a two-time Olympian, six-time world champion, who casually went from the Turin Olympics to the NFL Combine and got drafted fifth round to the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't have these prodigy skill set out of the womb. I didn't know who or what I should be, so I tried to do what they were doing. I became a serious student, and I started competing in skiing. And it was all going well until I turned 12, and I was diagnosed with severe scoliosis. And I had to go in for emergency surgery, and the surgery was six hours, and they fused my top 11 vertebrae together and affixed the whole thing with two titanium rods. And the doctor said, kiddo, I think your ski career is over. But I was 12 years old and in the habit of not listening to adults ever. And so within a year, I was back on the slopes. At 19, I made the US ski team. At 20, I was third overall in North America. And I qualified to ski in the Olympic qualifier. The visibility was really low that day, and the race officials put little pieces of pine bough on the course to show depth. I had skied over these pieces of pine bough a thousand times. But this time, one of them wedged itself perfectly in between my boot and my binding, and my ski pre-release 20 feet in the air, and I fell directly on my metal spine. And that was the ball game. You know, the, the day started out with Olympic dreams and it ended in retirement. And I was heartbroken. What would you do? I ran away. I ran to LA. I wanted to be warm. I wanted to be far away from the ski world. And I wanted to be far away from my family. And my parents didn't support this little uh, escape route. And so I had to get a job almost immediately. And the job I got was working for a diabolical, tyrannical real estate developer in Los Angeles. And he was always coming up with new, you know, non-traditional tasks for me. And this, time, this particular day, he walked into the office and said, I need you to try to look decent tonight, and I'm not sure if you can do that, so that you can serve drinks to my friends at a poker game. And, you know, I thought about quitting like I did every five seconds, but I was proud, and I didn't want to go home yet. So I borrowed a dress, I went home, and started Googling things like, what kind of music do poker players like to listen to, and uh, what do they eat? And so I showed up to this event and, uh, with a mixed CD that had songs on it like The Gambler, <laughs> and uh, my cheese plate from the grocery store. And it was all, as you would imagine, red solo cups, a dingy basement, and then the players started to arrive. And in the door started walking 10 of the most famous, wealthiest, and most powerful men in the world. Just some names, Ben Affleck, Tobey Maguire, Leonardo DiCaprio, and some names that I can't mention. 
for various legal and moral reasons. And I had a light bulb moment. I, I realized in that moment that this is not an opportunity that a 23-year-old from a small town gets to have access to this network, to this capital, to this information. So I wanted to stay there. And at the end of the night, I made $3,000, and I was like, I'm in. So I went home, and I started trying to research. I, I, tr I learned everything I could about poker. But what I'm more focused on is learning about the customer. Who are these guys? They have all the access in the world. Why do they want to sit in this basement and play poker with each other? And um, I started coming up with ideas and, and, and inferring ways to, to, to build more value, to create value. And the players took notice, but so did my boss. And he started to feel threatened, and he called me one day and said, send me all the accounting, send me the list, you're done running the game, and you have to come back to working for me at the office. But there was no way I could go back to being his errand girl, to being his punching bag. But I also saw something I couldn't unsee. I was starting to realize that I was actually, what I was actually good at, and that I had this entrepreneurial mind. I saw how I could turn this game into a business for myself, to a brand. And so um, I did something that was risky, and I was certainly not a favorite. I went up against the Billionaire Boys Club, asked them to forego one of their own, and allow me to run these games. And somehow it worked. To this day, I'm still not sure how. And so the game was mine. And so now I was free to implement these ideas that I had to, to build this brand, to make a business. And the first thing I did was I raised the stakes from 10 to 50,000. This increased the mythology, the adrenaline, because what I had realized about these guys, about this client, is that they could go anywhere, they could buy anything, and what they wanted was experiences. They wanted a transformational experience. They wanted to walk in this room and feel like James Bond. And so I built on that. I moved the game out of the basement at the Viper Room to the penthouse at the Four Seasons. I hired beautiful people to, to serve them drinks and food and to memorize their specific orders because we know that you can't place enough value on having someone feel heard, seen, and remembered. And I needed to find new players. And I didn't have direct marketing or advertising or lead generation. So I came to Vegas. And I contacted the top casino host, and I said, look, I have a deal for you. I have 20 of the biggest gamblers in the world. I'll bring them to Vegas, we'll do a game in the villa, and they'll come down to the floor and they'll lose millions of dollars. But what I need is I need leads. I need new clients. I need names and numbers of people in the area that, that will play this big. And I got most of my big, big uh, players like that. And so I was the owner, the operator of this game, and it became one of the biggest high-stakes poker games in the world, certainly one of the most infamous. But I had a silent partner, a person that was so invested in this game, as invested as I was, but didn't want a fair fight. And this person was Spider-Man, otherwise known as Tobey Maguire. And he loved to take people down in poker. But he wanted a game that was tailored and engineered for his win, and not in a fair way. So he did things like lock down his chips, wouldn't you know, give any action. But then he took it a step further, and he found very good players. He brought them to the game. He staked them, meaning he paid for their buy-in. And uh, that's politely called collusion, but realistically called cheating. You can't have another player. You can't play with the same money at a table. So I had to put my foot down. And um, I knew that this was going to be hard. And it culminated in a very weird standoff. Toby came over to the table with his $1,000 chip and said, here's your tip for the night. But in order to earn this, I will need you to get on the desk and bark like a seal. And I was like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and it, you know, the, the players were watching, and it, was, it, it all built up and ended up, you know, 30 minutes later, he's still going. And finally, I said to him, I'm not doing that ever for any amount of money. And I knew in standing up to him that I was probably going to lose the game. And that's what happened. He conspired with another player, and he took the game. So here I am again. I'm finished. This is over. 
I've lost everything. What do you do? Well, like Aaron says in the movie, Aaron Sorkin says in the movie, what's the one thing that makes you feel good about losing? Winning. So I decided to go to New York. And I had my challenges. This was 2008. The Wall Street was falling apart. And I was fishing around Wall Street for players. But I blocked out the noise, and I blocked out the naysayers, and I just focused on, on, the, on the plan. And by the end of 2008, I built a game that was five times bigger than my LA game. It was a $250,000 buy-in. People were winning and losing five to $10 million a night. It was politicians and athletes and Wall Street guys. And there's no women that ever played. I don't know why. Probably they're too smart. <laughs> But, um, and this time I wasn't going to be replaceable. I decided to make myself the bank. I was the owner and the operator, but that hadn't served enough, so I made myself the bank. And I extended credit, I guaranteed the money, and I covered the losses when people didn't pay. And something happened to me, and I became obsessed. And I got greedy, and I no longer started participating in intelligent growth. Uh, I had the big game, and it was getting bigger and bigger. I saw someone lose $100 million in a night. I had smaller games, the small stakes games. I had variations of Texas Hold'em, PLO and stud. And I had games all day, every day. I had millions of dollars out on the street, and my life was massively unsustainable. And instead of scale it back, I tried to, to match the unsustainability with drugs, with alcohol. And I became addicted to drugs and alcohol. And I became caught up in greed. And I was making very reckless, reckless decisions. And as you can see, the train's starting to come off the track. But don't worry, I've got a couple more months of bad decision making before the whole thing derails. <laughs> so let's go back to LA for a second. There was a player, affectionately known as Bad Brad. And he was known as Bad Brad because he couldn't win a hand of poker. And he would come to the game every night, and he would lose hundreds of thousands of dollars cheerfully, to the extent that I pulled him aside and said, hey, you know, Brad, this might not be for you. And we all thought that we were getting one over on Bad Brad. But Bad Brad was getting one over on us, because he was raising money for his hedge fund at the table, even though he couldn't win a hand of poker. He talked about his returns on his oil futures and this and that, and I watched these guys invest $20 million with him. Well, Brad's hedge fund wasn't as much of a hedge fund as it was a Ponzi scheme. So when he got indicted, he told the feds all about this poker game in, in Los Angeles, the celebrities that played, and the girl that lured him in. So now I'm on the radar of the West Coast feds. Let's go back to New York. So I'm running these games, you know, not paying attention to the fact that it's reckless and dangerous. And this is something, a business that normally is run by the mob. So I get a call, these guys saying that they're from New Jersey, and they want to talk to me about business. So I meet with them, and they make it very clear that there needs to be a partnership. And, you know, for a litany of reasons, I turn them down. And the, the reasons I cite are, look, I can't go into business with you guys. I'll lose all my players. It's a lose-lose. It's a um, and I politely walked away. And I, I, I avoided phone calls from them. And they sent someone to my apartment. And he put a gun in my mouth, and he beat the hell out of me. Now, you would think I was ready to walk away. But I wasn't. And while I let my face heal and didn't tell anyone, because I was scared, um, the newspaper came. And they had arrested 125 people in the biggest mob-related takedown in New York City history. So I got really lucky there. But it did stop me from making really bad decisions. So I went out in recruiting, and I went to uh, different boroughs in New York, specifically Brighton Beach. And I found some very wealthy, successful Russians. And their story checked out. They showed up well-dressed, uh, well-spoken, educated. 
But it turns out they were running the biggest health insurance fraud scheme in New York City history, $100 million. So they're on the radar of the, of the East Coast feds. So now we see a really clear picture here. West Coast feds, Ponzi scheme, celebrities behaving badly. East Coast, Russian organized crime, Italian mob, hedge fund guys, all connected by this poker game. So I'm sure you know how this ends. In 2011, I get a text message from my poker dealer saying, the feds are here. They're looking for you. Don't come here. So finally, I knew it was over. And all I wanted to do was go home and see my mom. So I packed a bag, put, took my dog, my beagle, who's 20 years old, who's been with me through all of this, and uh, headed for the airport. As I was trying to purchase a, a plane ticket, my credit card got declined. I logged onto my accounts, and all of them were seized, frozen in the red, millions of dollars, gone. And the Fed said to my lawyer, we want her to come in and tell us what she knows about organized crime, about celebrities, um, about Wall Street. And I passed. And I moved back in with my mom, and I didn't have any money, and my reputation was in tatters, and my network was decimated. And after feeling sorry for myself for a couple weeks, I got out of bed and I said, you're not going down without a fight. And I had to own all the mistakes that I made and, and take a really hard look at them. And then I looked with clear eyes at what's the, what's the asset here? What's the monetizable asset here? What's the reinvention? And I believed it was the story. I believed it was the story. So I got a book deal. Uh, I spent two years writing the book. And I got a job, and I moved back to LA. And it seemed like things were back on track. And 10 days later, after I moved back to LA, I got arrested by 17 FBI agents in the middle of the night. High beam flashlights, semi-automatic weapons. I got really sick of getting held at gunpoint in my apartments. Um, and they put a piece of paper in front of me that said, the United States of America versus Molly Bloom. And I was looking at a lot of jail time. Again, the feds wanted me to become a confidential informant. They wanted me to give up my hard drives and go on the record and, and tell them what I knew about these people. But the truth is, is that I built this game. I enabled the gambling. I profited from the gambling. If there were consequences, I needed to stand up for them, not on the backs of people that I had engaged in, in this activity. So I pled guilty, and I was facing 10 years. Luckily, I had a very merciful judge who sentenced me to no jail time. And again, you know, I was so happy that I wasn't going to jail because losing your money sucks, but losing your freedom is a whole different story. And, but I was still in a bad spot. I had no money, no job prospects. Now I'm a convicted felon. And so, you know, the book didn't make enough noise, so I needed to go some, to somewhere and someone who could make that noise with this story, and that was Hollywood. And so I started kind of running numbers on, on writers. And what I came up with is that when Aaron Sorkin makes a bet, it pays off. He gets box office, he gets award noms, and he writes with an intelligence and humanity. So I started going around to, um, different agencies, lawyers, managers. And what I realized that is that everyone wanted to hear the story, but nobody wanted to make it. There was too many people involved. It was too risky. So I just used those meetings to ask people if I could get to Aaron. Can I meet Aaron Sorkin? Can I meet Aaron Sorkin? And most people laughed me out of their office. But survival mode is a whole different deal. You get to check the ego at the door. And it's empowering. And so finally, I found someone. And he asked Aaron for a personal favor, and Aaron said yes. So I flew to LA and tried to muster up the last bit of confidence that I had inside. And I told him my story. I, and it must have worked because he said to me, wow, I've never met someone so down on their luck, yet so full of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history. You know. I, Three and a half years ago, I thought I was going to jail, and this year I went to the Oscars. 
And I guess what I want to say is, we're all going to fall. And whether you're like me and you knock yourself down over and over, or whether the world knocks you down, it's never too late for reinvention. It's never too late for a second chance. And it's in you to keep going. And that's my playbook on intelligent growth. <laughs> Thank you very much.